Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to this special bulletin of the Calypso Cigar Review Podcast. I am Brandon Luna. I'm Randy Rankin. And we have some special guests to, guests with us today. Yes, we do. Easy for you to say. Yep, exactly. <laughs> we have Brian Holtzworth. With House How Familia. about Brandon Holtzworth, Brandon, since his name's the same as yours? Holy monkey balls. How hard is it to screw that up? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm starting over. <laughs> He's too vain to let us ride that one out. <laughs> yeah, hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to this special bulletin of the Calypso Cigar Review Podcast. I am Brandon Luna. I am Randy Rankin. And I am Brian Holsworth. <laughs> Brandon Holsworth with House of Emilio has joined us today. We have a full panel today. We've got some legends in the industry here. We do, to discuss the, the FDA's hose-over Bullshit. <laughs> of the cigar industry today with us. Wow. God, you're good. Keep going, it's, man. It's, it's yeah, going great. This is awesome so far. Today it's with us great. we have William Cooper of Cigar Coop. Welcome, hey, guys. William. Hey, guys. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. And he's also on Stogie Geeks, one of my favorite other podcasts out there. Oh, so you know my bosses, Chris and Kyle. Yes. Yeah, they're good dudes, man. Yep. Yep. They've been on the show. Okay. Very supportive of us. Yep. And also today we are visited by Kirk from Poolside Cigar Reviews. How you doing, everybody? Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us, Kirk. And he won't sound like he's uh, talking through a fan today because he bought a land cable. <laughs> <laughs> and also from Blind Man's Puff, we are joined again by Emmett Malone and Aaron Lewis. Yeah. Emmett Malone's a little green in the gills today. Yeah, I'm feeling really Irish today. I don't know why. <laughs> and say hello, Aaron. Or not. Hello, Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Did he freeze up? He froze up. Can you hear me now? No, he's there. Aaron, can you say hello? Can you hear me? <laughs> I can see him moving. Yeah, we got you. Here you know. Okay. okay. Your name's gone. You hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to add it back in. There we go. Okay. All right. So even though he didn't say hello to us, we'll still let him be on the show. Yeah, you have to you put go. quarters in that thing to keep it going? <laughs> What's going yeah, on with possibly. that? Possibly. Yeah. So we are here on a serious issue today. The FDA um, put out a, a deeming document that basically is got a crap ton of regulations on cigars, and uh, so we wanted to give our two cents on that and get the info out to the listeners um, so they can actually get an idea of what all the legal jargon means and break it down for them and actually give them a, a method to help the way right. that, best way that they can. Yeah, to contact the FDA and, and let them know their feelings. So both you guys have a lot of great information up on your sites, uh, Cigar Coop and uh, Blind Man's Puff. First thing I wanted to talk about, and don't forget, Kirk uh, also has done an yes, and Kirk, episode. Yes, Kirk did do well. a, a quick little episode there as well on his feelings on this subject. Um, so, what what to you guys is the primary issue that you have with the the ruling? What's the one thing that stands out to you that just needs to go away? I think the ten dollar price tag is is ridiculous on yeah. on what qualifies a premium cigar. I think you know. Four dollars would be more reasonable, but still, that I mean, that gets rid of a lot of my favorite, uh, you know, bargain cigars. But ten dollars is out of control. Totally agree. Totally agree. Does anyone have any idea on how that's going to skew everything? Because that's going to make the cheapest cigar. So take like that brand that you would never buy, and now that's ten dollars. Yeah. Now take your super premium, and if you have that ten dollar price point as the nil or the zero, you're going to attack on that additional price. So let's say your favorite cigar. Is eight or nine bucks. That's going to make your favorite cigar eighteen, 18 or nineteen dollars. Well, I don't know if that's the case. I I would assume that the, what what happened is the market wouldn't just wouldn't buy those cheap cigars, and you know your padrones of the world would if they were smart. What I would do is hold my price steady and say, well, you can buy a padrone for you know twelve bucks. You could buy a Ron Mexico for ten. You decide. Uh, that's right. that's how I would do it. Well, it would depend on. on how sorry, to, sorry, sorry to play devil's advocate. <laughs> no problem, but we haven't, we haven't even heard how they're going to tax this. So if they're taxing it at a higher rate, then obviously it will go up to it. You will have to do what Brandon was talking about and charge 18 19 bucks for an $8 stick. What, what annoys me to know in is that this is a 241-page document, mm -hmm. and the government has a habit of doing this, where they'll come up with one subject that they want to address, but then sneak in like 15, 20 other oh, yeah, things absolutely. to say, okay, if you pass this, which is really what we're trying to get passed, you're also going to pass all this other crap. Mm -hmm. And that just seems to be yep. the methodology on everything they do over there, unfortunately. I could see Will Cooper like holding his tongue over there. Let us have it, Will. Bring it. Bring the heat. I mean, the fact that this is foundational, and they said this is foundational, it's the start of the storm. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've seen this happen with anti, you know, anti-tobacco. That's been their approach. They, they go for some, and then they come back for more. Yeah. So I have a lot of concerns, obviously, about the whole definition of a tobacco product, not just the $10 thing. I mean, the, the long filler thing concerns me as well. That's a big part of the industry. You know, you know mixed filler cigars, a lot of companies depend on selling those tobaccos. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's important for budget price cigars. So that that's something that alarms me. I think the ten dollar thing. I, I want to be optimistic and say that may just fall apart. Um, but the long filler thing scares me a little more. The what part? I didn't hear you. Long filler. The, oh, long, the filler. long filler. So long, probably my voice. Long filler. Yeah. So that was one of the in, un, when they mentioned the in, under option two what the what they're defining as a premium cigar. If mm-hmm. you look in the document, that was item number three. Yeah. So. I kind of have an I have a big issue with that right now. Um, a lot of companies are dependent on you know mixed filler cigars are, are an important part of the industry too. Yeah, they are because they keep costs low. Uh, you know, a lot of the American public wants to speak. You know, like let's be honest, there's a lot of is it misogyny? Is that the word I'm looking for? I think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, when these companies make their long filler cigars, there's a lot of stuff that falls on the ground, and if you're going to just throw all that away, well, you're throwing a lot of money right down the yeah, toilet. Sure. Yeah, and sure. one of the uh, American misnomers is that if it's not a 100% long filler cigar, it's not a great cigar. Now, while House of Emilio and Ezra Zion only used, this is my shameless self-promotion, yes, they only use you know, double grade A, very aged tobaccos, there's still all that stuff that doesn't make it into the cigar. Mm-hmm. And if that's not sold, you're going to see the, pr- the cost of your, you know, your 100% long filler cigars go through the roof. Yeah. Right, and I look at, for example, under House Familio, Guaycon, you know, Noel's, Noel's got the factory, he's building that new factory, and I'm sure he's going to have a lot of leftover tobacco, and I'm sure that's going to, you know, he could sell that, and I'm sure that's going to help him. So that could affect his bottom line in, in producing that, that premium product that we're more accustomed to that maybe we talk about more. Yeah, Especially with Guaycon, I mean, uh, you know, the, the shameless self-promotion is over, I already did that. But uh, you know, for the price points, I mean, Guaycon's what six, six yeah. fifty, seven bucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, to keep those prices low, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that every stem, every every piece of this tobacco gets used, whether it's used in cigarettes or, or you know these green insecticides. Every bit of this is sold to another company, in turn, keeping their costs low. Right. Now, one thing I, I I'm going to be with. Uh, Join Kirk and play devil's advocate on one issue that I don't have a problem with. The six pounds for thousand cigars is fine because that eliminates your disarms and your, you know, your little cigars. I, and when I say fine, I don't mean I like it. I'm just saying I can understand it because they are defining premium cigars. But uh, you know, the fact that they they think that this cigar that I'm smoking is the same thing as a disarm or a Swisher sweet little cigar is ridiculous. It's it's just insane. On the other side of that, though. You have to remember that the American government and these special interest groups do a, a separate and attack. So, okay, we get rid of flavored cigars today. That destroys Drew oh, yeah. Estates right off the bat. And, you know, J.D. is, I wouldn't say we're great friends, but I have a huge appreciation for the man and everything he's done for this industry. But, you know, you start off by saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of flavored cigars because kids love them, which is absolutely false. Mm-hmm. So what you do is you've, getting, you've taken the pie and then you take a slice out of it, and the pie gets smaller. Yeah. So, okay, now we're going to get rid of uh, short filler cigars, or we're going to make it so that to have a short filler cigar, you have to donate so many thousand cigars to the government to go through and find out whether or not it's a good product. And then they're going to get rid of that. And then what are we left with? We're left with super premium cigars that are going to start at 10 bucks a piece. Yeah. And when I say I was, I was okay with that, I just meant that if they're going to do anything, that one doesn't bother me as much. But you know me, yeah. I'm anti-government sticking our nose in anything, so I'm, I'm totally pissed off that we're even having to do this episode. My kids are more in interest, my son is more interested in porn than he is in cigars. Yeah. <laughs> my job as a parent is to make sure that he doesn't look at that porn unless I'm not around. <laughs> <laughs> so Anna, you, you, uh, you wrote a great article and you put it on Facebook and I read it. Uh, why don't you set it up for the listeners and... Kind of give us the point-by-point point breakdown so that our listeners know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, I just threw you on the, under the bus. <laughs> well, basically, I mean, there's there's two different options that they're looking at, and we're all talking as if 
they're going to go with the one that uh, wouldn't screw the industry over as much. But, I mean, worst case scenario, I mean, they could ban uh, free samples, which would totally destroy, you know, what we do. We couldn't we couldn't get our samples from manufacturers to review. Brandon, uh, Brandon's job. My job's gone at that point. <laughs> IPCPR would be gone. I mean, I don't know how they would expect to sell cigars without, you know, allowing retailers to try it first. That that scares the hell out of me, too. Um, and, you know, that's worst case scenario. I'm not, I can't remember what all the, uh, the option one would get rid of. Let's see. Uh, option one was every cigar and e-cigarette and anything, hookah, whatever, yeah, so, is under the microscope. So there would also be labeling requirements, uh, you know, covering up the whole box with warnings about how you're going to die if you smoke it. Uh, ingredient disclosure, I'm not sure how that yeah. would affect us too much, but... Um, Have any of you seen the, uh, like the cigar packs that they sell in other countries with these logos on it? I mean, they, sh they show throat, pa throat cancer patients on the cigar package. Yeah. Uh, guys with breathing tubes, I and mean, it's disgusting. Yeah. And part of part of the allure of, of uh, cigars is the romanticism of it, and you want to see the nice label, the nice bands, and the nice boxes, and stuff. You don't want to see a throat cancer patient on there. My question is, yeah. who are they getting away from that freedom of speech, uh, the art aspect of this in the Constitution? Because there is a true art to rolling cigars, the blending of cigars. And then you also have to take in all of the logos, all of the artwork that's on the boxes, because let's be honest, there's some of these cigars that have been around for so long that the artwork is iconic. Fuente. Fuente. Yeah. Or, you know, Monte Cristo or some of this. You know, uh, the, the whole aspect of saying that you can't have artwork on a, a band is pretty much, that's anti-constitutional to begin with. Yeah. yeah. But when is this government worried about constitutional over the last four years. I get a lot of people, you know, like in different parts of the country, they'll say, oh, it's uh, the Republicans. They're doing this to us. Oh, it's the Democrats. But the truth of the matter is, is it's special interest groups that are very, yeah. very minute. Yeah. If you travel down a highway, you'll see a sign that says uh, something about the, the tobacco industry wanting, you know, uh, they're making a killing off of you. And then it's got a picture of a coffin. I, you know, I've been in this industry for a couple of years now, and you know, uh, the whole thing about this is you don't want your customers to die. Now, there's never all of these the factoids and all of the uh, the surveys. These are also done by special interest groups that are paid by people to find out the negative things. I mean, this is like global warming. They don't have a hundred percent proof on any of this. And if no. I get long-winded, just always cut me off. No, hey, Rand, I want to talk too. Hit you. Good, I like that. Brandon, that's a good point. And what really, you know, there's been a lot of misinformation and. You know, hey, tobacco-free kids is, is one of them leading the charge. And that's what's concerning me about the 75-day period right now because they're going to have a chance to, to just start plastering more yep. misinformation out there. Yep. You know, not only that, but you got 75 days of the public being able to voice their opinion on it, but have you gone to the site and actually tried to look at what, they're allow what they want you to do to do this? Oh, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and cigar smokers, you know, I know for me, we're pretty laid back people. You know, yeah. you got to make it easy for us to go. Like what the CRA does. You know, you go to the CRA and you sign up, and you go there, and you, all the senators are listed. You click your button, and you send your email out, and that's easy. They're not making it that way at all. Not They're at making all. it a, a chore to go there and try and defend yourself on this. They're making it very clear: do not do a cookie cutter letter. Yeah. Um, I I'm very concerned. I really want the guidance to come out from IPCB and CPR, the CRA, which I know they will put out. That's not the issue, but. I think it's very important that that guidance comes out first before you know we start hitting that site, so we, we have the right uh, direction there. Yeah, very true. Agreed. Very true. Agreed. The the ten dollar price point was a big point of contention for me, just because you know premium cigars. I mean, you can have a seven dollar, five dollar premium cigar, and what's funny is the, the cigar aficionado. I don't know if you saw their article on this, but it actually almost skewed positive. It was like, hey, they're not going to take cigars away from us, you know. And then they had. Um, the guy from uh, Christoph on there who's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad they didn't go after the premium stuff because his stuff's like, you know, $10, $15, so he's not worried about it. That yeah. just kind of worries me. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly how I took that article too. Mm -hmm. Half of article was pretty positive about it too. I was surprised to see them so up about it. it it's not a, right now, you know, I mean, I, I know the boutique community has been a little quiet right now. I'm sure they're kind of trying to digest it, but 
I would have loved to see the a few boutiques interviewed for that cigar aficionado story. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so I'll I'll address another aspect of I can't I think this is proposal two, but uh, damn, forgot where I was going. With that. <laughs> I said it so official on my product like, registration. Uh, what was exposure. it? Oh, yeah, the the register the process of them reviewing the cigar. So you're gonna have to. Sub so Brandon and I decide to blend a cigar. We're gonna have to pay between ten and twenty grand to the FDA to review our cigar, and it's it could take them up to two years to uh, to get to the cigar to approve us. Meanwhile, we're broke because we waited two years and we've spent all this money blending our cigar. And I know Kirk, you were talking something about that earlier too. Yeah, and you know, I think what that does is it leaves, basically it excludes all the small players from the market, so you're left with your Philip Morris or whoever they are now, I don't know what their what their name is anymore, but you're, you're left with the big guys who can afford that time and that money, and then you're blocking out all, all the boutiques, and basically, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the big players, you know, didn't oppose this at all, and were actually in favor of it, because right. they know they have the resources to get through this maze, and no one else does. And then you know they're they're left holding the basket, and they're happy. Yeah, you gotta, at that point you have a bunch of it, yeah. You get rid mm -hmm. of R and D departments. You get rid of competition. You get Absolutely. rid of so many aspects here. And you know if you make it so that the only thing that's left is Monte Cristo, Cohiba, and Romeo and Julieta, you know because they have the money and the staying power to stick around. Mm -hmm. I mean you just you shut yeah. down the entire industry. Yeah, you've you've got Altidus General and uh, Rocky Patel hanging out, you know. Yeah, and Fuente. For and, and you know, I hate to be pessimistic about it. To to go back to the point about contacting the FDA and leaving comments, or you know, I I don't think personally the cigar community or the tobacco community in general has has the resources or the manpower or the will to to fight something like this directly. I think really what it requires is talking to your neighbors. And your coworkers, because if you if you compare this to the the soda ban in New York, as far as the size limitation of of um, found drinks or whatever they were, you right? Know, no sodas over sixteen ounces. People went ape shit over that, and rightly so. It was stupid. You know, you're an adult. If I want to have a liter of you know Mountain Dew, I can have it. Um, and I think if you if you frame it and you and you include enough other people in that discussion. To me, that's the only way to do it, is to really talk to your friends and neighbors about not the way that it affects tobacco, but how that snowballs to other lifestyle decisions going forward. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I mean, it, it's a pretty small subculture. And, Brandon, you hit the nail on the head about the divide and conquer. I never hear the cigar community bitching about cigarette taxes. And, you know, and I'm not a cigarette smoker, and I, I don't really care for cigarettes, but, you know, we're not complaining about cigarette taxes, and I think we should be. Because, yeah. what you know, why? Why, why are cigarettes special? I, I just I don't get it. Yeah, it goes back to prohibition, really, is what it goes back to, because it was the government telling you, this is bad for you and you can't do it. And you saw how that went over. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's yeah. why they're not going after that industry again, because they've already done it and it failed. And there's more drinkers than there are yeah. cigar smokers. So. And it's, it's politi politically expedient, because you can always say, well, I'm trying to project, protect children. I'm trying, you know, and, and of course, you know, who's going to oppose that, you know, trying to protect children? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, no one's going to stand up and say, oh, yeah, I want I want kids to smoke. Um, but, you know, again, it's a parent's responsibility. And I do think it's okay. You know, if, if you have it banned for minors, then you've done your job. Just enforce exactly. that and exactly. move on. They can make their decision when they're an adult if they want to smoke. Yeah, once they reach the age of accountability, yeah, once yeah. you reach the age of accountability, you can decide what you want to do. Like with drinking. I mean, once you're 21, if you want to drink, you're fair. If you've, you've, you've achieved that level of accountability. In Arkansas, they passed in a midnight session. They said, uh, uh, we're going to pass a 68%. And this was probably about three years ago now, mm -hmm. I'm thinking. They uh, said, we're going to pass a tobacco tax that's going to make everything across the board. Pipe, cigarette, cigar, you know, snuff, snooze, whatever you want to call it. 68% just being having a tobacco product in it. Now, when it comes to uh, a capitalistic society, and, you know, if you're just worried about, you know, income and taxes... They had about 30 stores in Arkansas, and they passed it, and most of the retailers didn't find out about it until the next morning. They found out, oh, my goodness, we have now a 68% tax that also included shipping. They went from 30 to 5 stores overnight, and they were decimated. The thing about this was they had people that were still smoking cigars. They were just 
ordering them online. Yep. Now, you know, all that money that could have been taxed and the state making money off of it, I mean, if they would have done it smart, they would have done something different. And it took three years of that state, because I was one of the few reps that actually went through Arkansas. And they would tell me, you're, you know, it got to the point where reps didn't even go to the state because with that 68% tax, if that cigar wasn't three or four bucks, there were places that weren't going to carry it, except for, you know, uh, Romeo's up there in Bentonville. He was yeah. in Greg up in uh, Pipe and Tobacco uh, in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. But other than that, their cigar shops, when you walked into them, they were buying the cheapest bundles and just refilling the box that they got on the first order. It yeah. just destroyed their whole... Uh, it destroyed them for three or four years. Yeah, it's an infrastructure breakdown at that point. I mean. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, back to Brandon talking about the uh, the process to actually get your voice heard by the F FDA. Uh, don't let that be a hindrance. Go ahead and do it. I mean, it's important. We've got to put our voices out there and, and make it happen. But also to another point that Brandon made, this Brandon, uh, there is a lot of apathy in the cigar community. Uh, as I've mentioned on previous episodes, Matt is the uh, owner of the store. He's the president of the Texas Cigar Merchants Association. And it's that's fighting on the state level, of course, not federal like we're talking about. But anyway, just to show an example, less than a third of the stores in this, in this state are members of the Texas Cigar Merchants Association. And it's like, why would you not join up and help the fight to keep your store alive? But it's, it's apathy. And I know Matt uh, has been... Uh, asked by PCPR several times to go up to Washington to campaign for this on the federal level, and he's done it many times, and other retailers have been asked to do this, and they've, they've rejected it. And it's like, why why wouldn't you want to go up and fight for this? And I think us as just, you know, regular Joes that smoke cigars, we need to still make our voices heard, regardless if it takes us 15 minutes on the internet. Go out there and, and do it. Just make your voice heard. Yeah. The hardest part is getting people to talk about it when they're not at the cigar shop. Now, yeah. if you're in Arkansas or you're in one of these states that has uh, had these huge taxes, 68 70 75%, the store owners themselves will tell you the reason that these taxes went through and weren't opposed were because the large majority of cigar smokers were lazy. Mm -hmm. It's easy just to sit there in your cigar shop and bitch and complain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you got to remember, if you're like a big cigar... It isn't going to be there if you don't say something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of people hide behind organizations like the CRA. They're like, well, I did my bid. I signed up for the CRA, and they're fighting for me. But it, it, we're beyond that now. I mean, this is this is down to a personal level mm -hmm. where if you don't do your part, yes, the CRA is there, and yes, the organiz other organizations and IPCPR, are there, and IPCPR, and to do what they can. But we've got to make more noise than that because apparently it's not happening. Aaron, you got something to say? Aaron? Can we hear him? Frozen. Is Aaron frozen again? He's riveted. <laughs> He's riveted. <laughs> yeah. And the other point too, when you mentioned you mentioned Kirk about you know telling everybody around you about this, um, here's here's my thing on this, and I talk to people at at work about this, is that people don't want to fight for something they don't like, even if it is something that should be that the the government should have any hand in. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to people about smoking and smokers. Oh, I don't like smoke. It's, uh, it's gross, and uh, if it goes away, I'm fine. It's like, yeah, but that's a freedom yeah. that they're taking away from us. That's the government saying, we don't want you to do this because it's bad for you, because we say it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. And we've got an organization with people behind us that says it's bad, and we're going to knock it down. But, I mean, if what if those same people then love Coca-Cola or love McDonald's, and they say, guess what? That's bad for you, too. We're going to tax the crap out of that, and you can only have McDonald's one day a month. Yeah. What are these people going to do? Are they going to go, ah, no, they're going to go out and say, okay, hey, this is something I want to fight for. Well, yeah. here's the difference. you got McDonald's, you got Burger King, you got Wendy's. you got a bunch of mega, mega corporations that realize what's on the line, and they're all going to fight for it tooth and nail. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the lawsuits that McDonald's alone has gone through, uh, and then $10, 15000000 million or a billion dollars isn't a big deal to someone like this. Yeah. Now, with yeah. our industry, you do have a bunch of major players, but when it comes to the boutique guys, uh, a good friend of mine, Fred Rui with Nomad, I mean, I, mean, I guarantee you Fred's going to stand up and he's going to throw every dollar at it, but it isn't going to be anywhere close right. to 15 or $20 billion. Right. You know, this is just his passion. Yeah, and we've talked about it before that uh, Marvin uh, Samuel from uh, Drew Estate, the last two years of his life has been spent in Washington, D.C., trying to prevent what is happening. 
and you see that it didn't work because they're still doing it anyway. So that, and the reason I'm saying that is because it's just, that was just one of a few people. Rocky Patel, whether you like his cigars or not, the guy has been out there fighting for us for a long time. And yeah, he's fighting for himself. He don't want to lose his business. But it's still a bigger picture. Yeah, it's a bigger picture. He's helping the industry. He's helping us as consumers be allowed to do what we should be allowed to do anyway because we're grown-ups. Yeah. Marvin was telling me, uh, I went out to an event he had at uh, Town & Country. And mm -hmm. He was telling me he had gotten a, a condo or an apartment or something like that in Washington, D.C., and he was throwing these parties, and all of these, uh, you know, uh, these government officials and all of these people were coming to the party. And they, you know, they're sitting there smoking up on cigars, drinking his booze, and you know, oh yeah, we're gonna help you fight the fight. And then the next day, they turn around and they're pushing vote against this industry. And you know, you these the American people need to know that the constituents work for them. And if they're not working for them, we need to get someone else yeah. in there. Not to be real political, except for that we are. But people forget that we're a representative government. Yeah, the government is supposed to represent us and what we want, not the other way around, not dictate to us what they want. Yeah, that's the way it should be, but yeah. <laughs> I think really the government represents big business, and that's yeah. what it's become. Yeah. But it's not a right wing, and it's not a left no, wing. No, it's not, uh, because uh, Harry Reid is on our side. Harry frickin' Reid is on our side. He probably owns a couple stores. He might, I don't, and if he does, more power to him. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. Kerry has resigned on Harry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so what We'll let other people talk. So, Aaron, can you hear me now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Why don't you, All right. why don't you get you in a little bit and see what you think. Give us, some, give us some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, we've covered a lot of good good stuff, but I think uh, the big thing is really getting uh, the response out there to make sure that uh, option two is actually what is adopted based on the what they put forth because that's – if option one goes into place, like we were talking about before, you, pretty much you have just big brands with four lines – Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have no more limited editions. There's all, that's all gone. You know, any any of those, um, you know, small cigar shops that you go into that only carry the the big brands and nothing else. That's what every humidor is going to look like at that point, because you're not going to be able to get you know any of the small companies can't do it anymore. Right. So I know here at the store, and Brandon can attest to this because he was a customer at one point. Uh, I'm kind of was joking there. Yeah, I still am, <laughs> jackass. Joking, but. Uh, you know, part of the way you build rapport is to, you have your customers that come in on a frequent basis, you give them a cigar, let them try something else that you know because it's in their flavor profile, and you think, hey, you might like this, here's you a free cigar. That would kill our ability to create goodwill with our customers. On top of it, killing the reps. How many times does someone come in the store and say, what do you got that's new? Oh, it happens all the time. Our industry has turned into almost like the automotive industry. Or the craft beer industry. Yep. You got a 2013 Ford Taurus? Yeah, I love it. Have you seen the 2014? Oh, man, I don't care about my 2013 anymore. And our industry, you know, I'm not, you know, I like new stuff, but, you know, there's a lot of great stuff that's been around for ages that's just been associated as my dad's cigar or, you know, Oh, that's old, and our industry has, has turned a lot more into the automotive-style industry where it's what's new, what's new. You know, that does keep people talking. You know, let's be honest, uh, sites like Half Wheel, what would yep. they have to say anymore? What, what would bloggers have to talk about except for experiences they had with the same cigar that they, right. you know? What would Blind Man's Puff, what would Kirk's Cigar Reviews, what would Coop's, yeah. you know, us? We wouldn't have anything to talk about. We'd all be reviewing uh, Habanos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I would just drink more. <laughs> Why do that anyway? <laughs> you got any talking points, Coop? No, I mean, actually, that point about, you know, I built my brand on not just what's new, because uh, the what's new is, is an important part of the news I cover, but the boutiques I have found have been very, very supportive in terms of what, what I do and a lot of the media people do. And, you know, the big companies, a lot of times, some, some of them have been better than others. I don't want to knock all the big companies, but um, when it's come to contacting them in terms of getting information or getting news stories, it, the boutiques have been much more uh, friendly to that. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's been a, I, I cover I cover the cigar industry 365 days a year. I'd love to continue to do that, and I could not do it without the boutique market. Absolutely. So that will change what I do. Totally agree. Well, you yeah, get I mean, so many new faces. You get so many new people with new and exciting stories. You know, uh, you know, 
with when it comes to, well when you take the beer industry and the cigar industry there's a whole lot of parallels so you know let's uh, say company X comes up and their product is hot they're out there they're doing the interviews they're talking to you and then you have a, a huge distributorship uh, let's talk like uh, Blue Moon with Coors when Blue Moon first came out it was an amazing beer it yep. was delicious yep. I drank a are we on to say shit ton? Shit ton. Yeah. Shit ton, <laughs> Blue Moon. And then what happens? You have Coors that comes in, buys the name rights, and produces a beer that is kind of similar to it. And that happens in the cigar industry. Yeah. All of the new flavors, all of the new stuff that comes out happens from boutiques, which, you know, let's be honest, uh, you know, uh, I was told General by, tried to buy Padron. You know, these, these older corporations will, will come in and hand, all, hand off a whole bunch of money to buy the boutique and not saying the general did this like like Coors did but you know then they kind of do their own interpretation yeah. on it and they they make it their own and they pretty much ride the co coattails of that company uh that that spent all that time you know making a product great Toronto almost died when general took them over i mean Toronto went oh yeah to the and it's only since they pulled distributorship from Toronto or from general but now Toronto's putting out really good stuff but they, they almost got buried because of it. Well, again, you're talking, you're even getting in now to just the general anti-competitive nature of just the consolidations of corporations in this country anyway. And to continue the, the liquor analogy, I mean, you've got, um, is it uh, InBev's got all the beer in the world now pretty much. Diageo's got all the whiskey in the world. Yeah. And, and and they bastardize everything. <laughs> you know, they, they make a lot of boring stuff that appeals to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They make a lot of money doing it. But I mean, if I get a bottle of Lagavulin, it's not the same as it was since uh, since Diageo bought it, and and the the packaging is identical to the other Diageo Isla whiskeys. Yeah. You know, they own they own Kalila, and it's you know, and I think you'll you would see the same thing eventually. That's why you have General Naltidis. I mean, they they are the the InBev and the Diageo of the of the premium cigar industry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is from the deeming document. I'm going to go over some talking points here. <clears throat> and this is the proposed requirements, and we'll you know talk to each point here. Number one, wrapped in whole leaf tobacco, which I don't have a problem with. No. But okay, question: Does that mean that then anything like the uh, the can what well, the not the candelas, but with the ones that have the two wrappers? Barber whatever, pole. That, barber pole. Barber pole. So barber poles are out. I'd say no. I mean, they still two whole leaves, right? Back. Yeah. 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 And then uh, contains 100% uh, to leaf tobacco filler. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, number three contains primary long filler tobacco. We've discussed that. Yeah. yeah, primarily long filler tobacco. That's fine. Number four is made by combining manually the wrapper, filler, and binder, which, okay, that's fine uh, for me. Um, number five has no filler tip or non-tobacco mouthpiece and is capped by hand. We're still kind of in the We're area okay. of you know premium cigars. Here's yep. the one. Number six has a retail price after any discounts and coupons mm -hmm. of no less than ten dollars per cigar, adjusted as necessary every two years, effective July first, to account for any increase in the price of tobacco products since the last price adjustment. Now that is a loaded statement. Yep. That's so, so Brandon, it, I didn't mean to interrupt. There's two points to that. There's point one is. Are, are they going to say, it should price be an issue at all is the first thing? And I, and I say no. I agree. I, no, I agree. I mean, you could set the price at $3, and you're going to still have the same problem if they have any price thing in. So I, I think the $10 thing is horrible, and it's ridiculous, but I, I think the, the position has to be that price should not be a factor in this. And know? that's why I go back to the six pounds per thousand cigars yeah. aspect, because if you're going to do anything, if, if that's... Your guideline, okay, I got that. But why does price have to be an issue in this? That's that's yeah, that really yeah, I makes think six, sense. Six needs to go overall, and that should be one of the main talking points for fighting this thing. Um, you guys have anything else on that? Okay, the other, so the price point is one of them, and then adjusting as necessary every two years. Every two years, yeah. That's bad news, you know, because then you can you can open it up to even if they knock the price down to you know five dollars a cigar, you've still got that two year adjustment on that. Um, price that then leaves the door open 
for whatever the hell yeah, they're going to do, gonna do basically. next time. Yeah. Giving an inch is a defeatist attitude. Yeah, okay. I agree. totally agree. When you go in and say, okay, if it's a homogenized binder, it's not super premium, we're raising the price. You've already accepted some level of defeat. Exactly. Right. You're totally right. agree. Country totally is, agree. We have, to, we have to make a stand somewhere. This country was founded on very, very few things. We had cotton, tobacco, and sugar. Now, where's the sugar production now? Where is 80% of our cotton actually grown now? And if you think about it, a lot of people don't know this. <laughs> House of Emilio rules. But where I was actually <laughs> going to say there was uh, Houston, actually, uh, I think it was 17, 1800s, uh, grew a majority of the cigar tobacco that was consumed in the American continent. Wow. And where is all of our cigar tobacco now? I mean, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, that's Carolina, it. Carolina, Virginia. Yeah, but it's shrinking every yeah, year. Exactly. And you're not even allowed to smoke there. You know, I was in Esteli last month. And I walked into the hotel and I had a cigar in my mouth. You know, it was a three-hour drive from Managua to uh, the Low Sarcos Hotel. And I, I walked in, and, you know, you've had a cigar in your mouth for so long, and everyone else is smoking. I walked into the hotel, and I thought, oh, man, I got this stick in my mouth. Uh, and then I looked around, and then I realized, these people aren't trying to run industry out of their country. They accept and embrace it. Now, if we take the California model and just... Throw sriracha out there. Sriracha <laughs> is a huge. Now I don't know if you guys are fans of sriracha. It's that garlicky paste sauce, which oh, yeah. is absolutely delicious. I love it. It's on everything. I put it on every top ramen soup. Eggs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sriracha was asked to leave California because they didn't like the smell that it was putting in the air. Yeah. I'll be honest, man. That state is damn near. Ba it is bankrupt. How it's many times now? Yeah. So you're going to run all these industries out, all these mom and pops, and as soon as we do this and we start saying, hey. We're okay raising the prices three bucks. That's when the next year they come back in and say, "Hey, that three bucks wasn't enough." We'll tell you what: we're going to go over the whole thing, or we can raise it up another dollar twenty-five. And then we set ourselves into a blackmail situation, in which who's actually getting screwed? Mm -hmm. It's the American public. Yeah. It costs a dollar and a half, less than a dollar and a half, to produce a pack of cigarettes, and that's growing the tobacco, uh, curing, fermenting. Putting it in the tubes, including the price of the tubes, the pack itself, and the cellophane. Now here and union wages. And union wages. So when you guys go to the store, and uh, who's in California? Right here, Aaron. Aaron. Back Aaron, how yeah, much yeah. is a pack of smokes where you're at? Uh, I couldn't even tell you, but I'm sure it's probably like close to ten bucks a pack now. Yeah, and so, like six fifty here, so it's still high. And they raise it all the time. And who's not saying anything? It's mm -hmm. the American people that aren't showing right. up because right. they're they're so demonized. Yeah, I lived to to elaborate on what you just said. I lived in Bradenton, Florida, for a while, and I don't have the greatest sense of smell. And one day I got almost got sick inside my house, and I was like, "What the fuck is that?" And the dogs were going nuts, and uh, so I tried to fight through it. Huh? Dead hooker. No, no, okay. not that time. It was a, it was a different time. It's a different story, Brandon. <laughs> okay, a little for breeze. <laughs> so, little, uh, so then the dog had to go outside and went outside, and it was even worse. It, the smell just hit me so freaking hard. And what it was was that uh, Tropicana orange juice is based out of Bradenton, Florida, and they burn the orange peels like twice a year, and that's what was going on. And it just, it, like I said, it made me sick to my stomach. So I had a friend that was from Bradenton. I'm bitching about it. I'm like, man, it sucks. They gotta, they gotta give this up, man. And he's like, do you realize like Tropicana employs eight thousand people in Bradenton? And I went, oh, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> so I'll, I'll just put up with the smell because I don't want eight thousand people to lose their jobs just because of one day of smell twice a year. Yeah, but that's because I have a brain and I think about other people and a yeah. heart. You know, I worry about me. <laughs> Me too. I worry about you too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So to the next talking point, here's number seven on the list. Here does not have any characterizing flavor other than tobacco. So there goes Drew Estate. There goes Drew Estate. There, there goes CAO flavors. flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Done. Tatiana, I guess. Would cognac? Well, how, how do you, how do you kids draw a line of cognac? Right. What was that? How do you draw a differentiating line like that? You know, that's. What do you define as tobacco taste and flavor? Yeah, exactly. It's, you can't substantiate that. Well, it goes back to the enticing of kids to smoke yeah. them because they taste good. But you have to be 18 to even walk into a cigar store. Yeah. 
So, and uh, like you said earlier, you're, you're drinking a watermelon something ale. I wouldn't drink it myself because I'm a man, but <laughs> you know, my kids love watermelon. So they're going to probably drink that beer now. Yeah, they're going to be like, oh, watermelon beer, that sounds delicious now that I can't have a great blunt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I thought about this one, and I said, well, if I review a cigar and I said it tastes like cocoa and pepper, mm -hmm. right, suddenly if the FDA looks at that, they say, well, it doesn't have a tobacco, characterizing tobacco flavor. So that, that's kind of where I was going with no, that. No, I agree with you on that one. Yeah. That's scary stuff. Think about what that would do to the bloggers on how afraid they would be to give their own personal opinions on what a cigar tastes yeah. like. Exactly. Tastes like tobacco. This tastes like a tobacco cigar to tobacco me. Tobacco delicious. Yeah. I honestly don't think they would take it that far, but it does open up a can of worms. Yeah, totally. I, I, w I would assume it would be would be limited to you know additives that intentionally yeah. change. That, that, I, mean, uh, I mean, what about sweet and tip cigars? You know, there's a lot of... Them, they're still tobacco cigars. Oh, they they have a, the back rat. The yeah, back rat has that. Uh, I know a lot of guys would be really pissed off if they lost their black and milds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then the last. The well, black and milds are definitely going to be. Well, Aaron, Aaron, you're in Oakland, right? Uh, I'm Barry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, there's a lot of people like black and milds out there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but that, 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 that's the exact demographic I think that they're trying to go after. So. You know, you take away tobacco, you what do you have? You got a bunch of frustrated people that aren't going to have an outlet. Yeah. But let's be honest, man. Cigars, if you have a cigar, if you have an hour of your day and you have a cigar, you make it the best hour of your day. Yeah. It lowers you, your blood pressure because you're calm now. You're relaxed. We said it over and over again. Cigars are our yoga. You know? Yeah. That's what they are. They calm me down. I, I get centered when I smoke a cigar. They take that away from me. I'm going to be... Uh, you're going to be Fair. an even bigger dick than you are now. Exactly. They're my way of getting out of my honeydew list at the house. My <laughs> wife come in and she's like, hey, will you do this? And I'm like, yeah, let me finish this stick. And then you fire up another one. Yeah. Right after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you 100%, but I don't think the argument holds water with uh, with our state and federal legislatures, no. unfortunately. Yeah. Totally agree. But what does, really? It's, it's really, and, and the, the one, I, I really do think that the one ray of, hope that I see in all of this is I think um, a lot of the younger generation and I'll, I'll go ahead and then, even though I just had a big birthday I'll include myself in the younger generation um, yeah, me too we, ha we have a pretty wide libertarian streak um, and we're not single issue voters in general and, and I, I really do think that an age of embracing more personal accountability for your decisions is coming up because you know, I think what we've seen in the last really half century is uh, is is just in general American citizens wanting freedom, kind of, to, you know, a little bit of freedom, but no accountability. It's say, you know, it's it's almost like I look at, uh, you know, I I come from uh, like kind of West Virginia area, and you know they love coal in that state. Coal is king in West Virginia. Uh -huh. like, you know, now. down in Charleston, when you've got chemicals that leach into uh, that leach into the river, and all of a sudden nobody can drink water, then it's well, where the hell were the regulations that 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 let people put their chemical tanks right next to the river? You know, it's very reactionary, and it's always after the fact. Uh, you know, it's always after something bad happens that we look to blame. And and I and I guess people are trying to be more proactive with with tobacco regulation. But where I see appropriate regulation for tobacco is in general information and the problem when you're talking about cigarettes versus cigars people try to put tobacco all in one category mm -hmm. and the you know the and the problem with that is is if you guys have ever tried to do some google searches i mean i'm not uh, i'm not a professional researcher but i do some general google searches you cannot find solid research about you know premium cigar smoking pipe smoking anything because it's all lumped together and, and we fall into then this category, and this is where I just cannot believe um, the condemnation of e-cigarettes or vaping, whatever you want to call it. I don't do it. I, I think it's a bit queer, but uh, I apologize. If anybody on here vapes, I'm sorry. That was rude. Watermelon, watermelon ale. Beer. Watermelon beer guy. Hey, try <laughs> that watermelon ale. I bought it last year because I like the brewery. I think you would change your mind. It's it's very good. Uh, not <laughs> sweet. question. Do your shirts match your shorts? <laughs> But uh, no, I, now, now I lost my train of thought. So what I was getting at was the um, my world. the 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 e-cigarette issue. 
All right. Mm-hmm. God, I, I'm totally lost. Where does anybody know where I was? I really had a good point. To yeah, make. you're <laughs> in your backyard next to no grass. <laughs> You're uh, saying you don't understand. You said that you think the e-cigarette, e-cigarettes are kind of faggy, and um, <laughs> and you were going somewhere. Oh, oh anyway, okay. okay. yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I, I've got it now. And th- and this is where I look at it, and it's it's just completely ridiculous. This demonization of e-cigarettes, when okay, there very well may be long-term health consequences. I mean, obviously, putting a chemical in your body, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It's probably over time gonna, gonna. It's going to affect you, whether positively or negatively. It will have some effects. Most likely, it's not totally natural. It it could have potential negative effects over time. But yeah. the issue to me is weighing the alternatives, and that's what we don't do. Um, because you say, oh well, let's get rid of these e-cigarettes because they're harmful. Lots of stuff is harmful. And what they don't do, it's this abstinence-only mentality. And we see how well that works with, you know, sex education and other things. Yeah. Um, you know, an abstinence-only approach, be it tobacco or sex, is not going to work. And I think it's time to say, you know what, here's a safer alternative. Okay, of course, it's not safe. Um, but then the same thing with cigars. Obviously, I mean, I, I, I haven't done the research, I don't know, but... If I had to put my money down, I would say that, no, this probably isn't the healthiest thing I could be doing with my hour. Um, but I make that choice for myself, and I would like to see more disclosure. So I'm okay with the, uh, if you're going to put flavors or chemical additives in a cigar, tell me, because I'd like to know. Because, frankly, a personal choice would be to avoid that. But uh, yeah. sorry, thanks, right. thanks for letting me rant for so long. <laughs> the thing about this is that 100% of cigar smokers will die. So will 100% mm-hmm. of non-smokers. 100% of the people that drink water will die. You know, there's no way to get out of this. And the image that's put forth is, if you don't smoke, you're going to live forever. You know? Yeah. The only people that die are the smokers. And, you know, when you put it like that, I agree with you 100%. But you got to remember that, you know, this country wasn't founded so that the government could make choices for us. This govern- this This country was founded so that we could break free from English imperial rule. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, you got the the Clive and Bun, I know that's a whole different ball of wax. But you have our government that's coming down on us in every aspect of our life. I mean, when you think about uh, buying things, uh, hotel rooms, my hotel rooms on average cost me $117, but then I got $25 of tax. It really doesn't come down to anything about public concern of safety. It's creating a straw man to have a reason to increase the taxes. And, you know, you know. once again, going back to that separate and attack thing, please forgive me, John. No, no, go ahead. I just don't, I just, our government was designed to stay out of our business. Right. If I want to smoke crack cocaine, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, I should be allowed to smoke crack cocaine. Not that I would, on occasion. But, you know, I, I just think that as Americans, we should have the freedoms to choose whether or not. We all know cigarettes are dangerous. We all know that driving a car is dangerous. We all know that cheeseburgers are yeah. dangerous. We all know there's a good chance that if we get on a plane from Malaysia, no one's ever going to find us again. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, though. Well, that, the thing about cocaine brings up an interesting point. I live in Colorado, which, you know, they just recently, everyone knows, legalized marijuana. And everyone was freaking out about it for so long here, and really nothing has changed. Well, your I mean, screen is green. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been smoking a lot of it. That's just the internet. It's gone green over there. I mean, the only the only side effect so far has been that uh, our school systems actually have a little money now. My wife's a school teacher, and you know things are looking up here. And I there's been no deaths because of marijuana here. There's been nothing has happened, and it just yeah. it just proves that regulation on on stuff like that is is a joke. Well, guess- What's funny is is that in Colorado, your tax on marijuana is 25%. Your tax on a cigar is 40%. Wow. Yeah. Tell me that this product is so wrong that it deserves less of a tax than the thing that built this country. Yeah. Well, I made the joke, and, and but it's serious. I was talking to Pedro earlier. Pedro's here. Uh, that heart disease kills far more people than than uh, lung cancer. And yet, what causes heart disease? Obesity. They'll say cigars, but the number one cause of heart heart can- or, or, uh, heart disease is obesity. And what causes obesity? It's 
five dollar supersized meals at McDonald's. That and but yet they're not going to go after that. They it, it's the fact that they're just targeting us as cigar smokers when there's such a much bigger fish to to be landed if they really are trying to look out for us. And by the way, I don't want the government to look out for me. Yeah, no. that's that's my job. That's my friend's job. That's my job as a parent to look out for my kids. Yeah, that's yeah, my wife. absolutely. I'm make sure, I don't eat too much because she wants me looking good for the beach. <laughs> there so, you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she don't want to be seen with you if you look like a if you look like Brandon. I look yeah, like a manatee. <laughs> hit, hit me up, dog. It's fine. I think you're right to a point, but um, kind of taking the opposite view a little bit. I mean, without the FDA, before then, I mean, people were eating feces in their food and rat shit. And I mean, the FDA does do good in the world, and without them, a lot of a lot of bad things would be happening. So. Okay. The market. Okay, some, you know, some regulation is fine. Regulation. Yeah, and see, but that that's the thing where you say some regulation is fine. It's always after the fact, and that's what blows me away when you have an E. coli outbreak, and yeah. then all of a sudden you see Fox <laughs> News pundits saying, "Where's our FDA?" and for you know doing this, but yet again, you know, people don't want to fund the FDA. Um, and then you look people at don't want them sticking it. their nose. Oh well, you're gonna you're gonna hurt agriculture if you regulate this until there's an E. coli outbreak yeah. or until your coal mining chemicals leach into the river and your water becomes toxic. But E. coli really, is so different than what we're talking about. And I've been supporting you all episode, Kurt. So now fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the neck. Look at what the FDA yeah. is, is putting their attention to. So back in the '80s, right? FDA did like forty thousand different uh, investigations of you know food products, and that's where a lot of these regulations came from. How many have they done in the past couple of years? Like 9,000? Yeah. What are they doing with their time? They're not doing what they They're very, very firm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think what we're talking about is what most stuff comes down to in law, and it's the argument of reasonableness, which is different for each individual as far as what is reasonable, what is not. Mm -hmm. Well spoken, sir. Well spoken. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason we don't die from the food we eat. It's because of the FDA. So, I mean, they, they do do good, but I think in this case, I think ultimately uh, this is really scary and, you know, everyone's going to freak out about it. But I think in the end, they're going to go with option two, and I think there's going to be adjustments to it. And I think in the long run, it's going to be fine. Um, I, I agree. Sure. I like your positivity, but I yeah. am kind of on the opposite end of that. I don't I think worry. so at all. I, I think if, if we have 70 days, 75 days to react to it and we don't, uh, you're not going to yeah. see very much change to that. Yeah, the thing is that you do have to take action to make make sure right. that that option two is what happens. I heard Rocky Patel on another, on actually Cigar Dave. Yeah, yeah, we today, And I don't know if you heard it yesterday. He, and you know, I, I think he gave a quote to Cigar Aficionado, but what he said in Cigar Dave was very interesting. He was they were surprised that that happened in terms they were expecting to get the exemption, and they thought they had enough political clout on that. Yeah, so they, we did. Too. Yeah, so it was it was a surprise, and and my my gut tells me, anti tobacco. They maybe they maybe there was an underestimation of how strong anti tobacco people were, were working behind the scenes as well. So I want to be optimistic, but you know anti tobacco is well funded in this country. Mm -hmm. Matt, like yeah. I said, Matt went to uh, D.C. twice, maybe three times last year, and we were convinced we had a majority in the House that there was no way that this was that actually. They had proposed a bill, I, IPCPR, CRA, I can't remember, had proposed a bill that would exclude us, and we had a majority in the House that were going to sign on to that bill. So it is shocking that that wound up happening. Well, I think what happened, though, when the new Congress came in place in 2013, they had to reset the bills, and everything started over again. Mm -hmm. and they're not at that working majority. And I, I think had this deeming document come down two years ago when we had the majority, it may have been a different story. Yeah. But we don't have the majority yet, and they're at like 154 right now. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they still got some work to do there. I agree. I'm still, if I'm going to be optimistic, I'm going to be optimistic big time. <laughs> it's kind of like if I'm going to fantasize, I'm fantasizing about the hottest chick in the world as opposed to my next door neighbor. Uh, I'm going to assume, I'm going to hope that it just, they realize the ridiculousness of it and then shelve it for at least another couple of years. It'll be next year. If this doesn't go through this year, they'll push it next year. It's just the obsessive, compulsive nature of our government. Yeah. They want what they want. They have the money that's backing it. The straw man they have is perfect. Uh, you know, none of these people know anything about this actual industry itself. Mm -hmm. All they know are the factoids that they picked up off of the website of their choice 
or the website that they were instructed to read. And, you know, this isn't about free-thinking Americans. All right, when you go back to Prohibition, like we brought up earlier, Prohibition actually passed because of a relatively small amount of Americans who were very, very pushy and a large amount of Americans who were exceptionally lazy. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, we just, you know, the whole thing about, the, you know, these podcasts, you know, uh, these guys having me on. I mean, there's more than just us sitting here talking about it. You know, we got to get people motivated. You know, so what if that website takes 10 minutes to let these people know we don't appreciate them? You know, we have to do this stuff. Yep. I mean, this isn't just my, you know, honestly, I don't know what I'd do if I left this industry. I love this industry. I love all the people that are in this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a great amount of history. Actually, this guy sitting next to me, uh, I have more history with this guy than I do just about anybody else going back to the beginning. And the fact that he still talks to me, I'm very, very appreciative of. <laughs> I'm a long story there, that. but yeah. Fast. I'm joking. <laughs> now, Brandon's a good dude, and, and uh, it wasn't your fault. Mm -hmm. I never blamed you for that. I know. I know. But now he has to register with his neighbors. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> on a different episode, when we have you on, we'll talk that story because it's a funny story. But anyway, yeah, but get off, you know, if you want, if you like this and you want to do it, you want to go to your B&Ms and enjoy a smoke, do, go to the website, spend the 10, 15 minutes, whatever it takes, uh, send an email to your congressmen and women, so it can be PC there. Tell your friends about it, anybody that boots yeah. a cigar off you and mm -hmm. doesn't know how to smoke it, who cares, get them to go there too and do it. Yeah, before you hand it to them, go, hey, I'll give you a cigar, but I need you to do me a favor. Yeah. Take 10 minutes, and if they're not going to do that, you don't give them a cigar. Right. I mean, tell I'm them it's the most... Body. Huge cigar mooch. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, when I pull up to his farm, he comes out and he's like, Brian, good to see you. Big hugs. Let me help you carry all your stuff in. And then he picks everything up and puts it in his pockets and hands me back in an empty bag. Nice. <laughs> I mean, okay. we got to find ways to work this so people understand that, you know, I don't care if you've got a walk-in humidor at the house. You know, I mean, just because you'll have cigars that rest, rest, you know, last you the rest of your life. I mean, there's, there's guys out there, you know, that are huffing it, that are yeah. working every day, and then that one day of the week they have off, they're going to the cigar lounge. I mean, what are you going to do when, when these places of free thinking go on? Mm -hmm. You know, I travel across, right now it's nine states, and I have walked in to cigar lounges, and I have seen the most hardcore of the left, the most hardcore of the right, people of different races that truly dislike each other. I've, I've seen arguments that I thought were going to escalate into straight-up fist fights, But at the end of it, it always ends up with, hey, man, you want another cigar? I got <laughs> you. What do you want while I'm up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can understand why the government would truly want to get rid of these places because of how canonized that you're polarized, forgive me, how polarized the American people are right now. You know, let's be honest, man. A cigar lounge is the last, you know, the la one of the last refuges where you can go in, state your opinion. The other guy might call you a motherfucker. But at the end of the day, he's going to respect your opinion because you were both having a cigar on your day off. Nice. Yeah. Well said. Well put. Coop, you got anything? It's the most important 75 days in the history of the cigar industry in this country, without yep. question. Yep. Without question. The other thing is just, you know, I want to kind of – can I make a point about the e-cigarette piece? Yeah. Go for it. Well, so if you know, you know, we're cigar geeks. So cigar geeks, I'll say here, but – you know, it was amazing how mainstream media spun this thing um, on Thursday. Where, you know, if you know, if you don't follow some of the cigar industry stuff, you you looked at those reports and you thought it was all e-cigarettes. And I had I had several people who I smoke with, and I wouldn't say they they follow the industry very closely, but they like their cigars. They came in and said, "Hey, it was good. The government, um, they're going after e-cigarettes. Isn't that you know, wasn't that great?" I said, "Well, you you obviously don't know that cigars were a part of that." Yeah, that so, happened to me. That happened to me. I was at uh, Stogie's yeah. in Houston, and uh, was waiting for the the owner of the shop to show up. And we were, they had Fox News on, and the the ticker, the blurb on the bottom said FDA sets out to ban eighteen year old and under whatever with e cigs, and that's all it said. And I turned because I didn't know because I was on the road. I turned to my friend and I said, "Oh, cool, they left cigars alone." It wasn't <laughs> like I got back here and read Emmett's thing and went, "What the fuck." So yeah. it's important. It's very important that you go into your cigar shops, your tobacconist, and, and it's every tobacconist should be educating every single customer who walks into their store right now. Exactly. Exactly. It should be a requirement to purchase cigars, smoke yeah. cigar in that lounge. Yep. Yeah. 
I'll tell you what, well, a couple of years ago when the, tech, when the state of Texas was trying to impose a smoking ban, uh, we had a, a, an event here, and Matt had a laptop set up here in the lounge, and before you got your free cigar, you had to go on there and, and voice your opinion on the smoking ban. Uh, we, we made people do that. Yep. Yeah. Might have to do that again. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes back to what we talked about, a 241-page document where they attack one thing and roll in a bunch of other crap. Mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. don't realize that, you know. So we've got to make sure that they do. And that yeah. they I, take think, I think it's our responsibility as, as cigar media people to, I think we should try and uh, get the word out to make it easy for people to, to comment on this. And we should all be posting, you know, an easy link to, to where people can give feedback. I think something we should all do. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. What? And it's not, you know, I tell, I'm, don't, this is not a time to worry about being pushy or not. This is, this is survival mode we're in right now. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah, it's serious stuff. Yeah, our backs are against the wall on this one. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. Every great conversation, every great friend that I have started over a cigar. When I met uh, my wife's father, uh, we were just started dating, and I walked you in. You dated your wife's father? <laughs> <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a nice hair. I actually, uh, <laughs> my wife's father was a three-time pro bowler for the Houston Oilers. My brother-in-law, now my brother-in-law, was a third-round draft pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. I grew up actually playing rock guitar. Before my hair fell out and I had kids, I was kick-ass. <laughs> I walk into this farm, and her dad is six foot five. He's about 65 years old, 67 years old. And he walks up to me, and he goes, Jan, good work. You brought home a big one. And as he's going to slap me on the back, he goes, Who'd you play college ball for? And I said, actually, sir, uh, I was uh, I was in rock bands. <laughs> arm went straight to the ground, right? <laughs> so he, he, he goes over in the corner, and they're having this family argument, and I can see him over there, and his arms are going up like this at the sides. I can't hear what they're saying, but I could just imagine, why did you bring home this loser? Mm -hmm. So I thought, what do you do when people are talking bad about you, Bran? What do you do? You right beat, kill them with kindness. I thought, no. You go out on the patio and you have a cigar and a scotch, and these people can go fuck themselves. Nice. That's a good <laughs> so I go out on the patio, and he's got three ponds, and I'm watching like deer run across. I'm watching bass flip over on the water, and I'm thinking, well, Brandon, I hope you enjoy this view because you're never going to see it again. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the door opens, and it's it's my uh, my wife's husband, my wife's father. Man, I'm not good with family stuff. I'm Freudian like crazy. <laughs> Your tonight, wife's right? husband. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, uh, "You got another cigar in there?" And I said, "Yeah, it's in the bag next to the scotch." So of course, he scores himself two fingers of my scotch and empties out half the bottle. He gets a Padron 25 and he sits on the right. I mean, we're out there for about 10 minutes. He doesn't say a word to me. Period. Because at this point, he thinks I'm some musician loser. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring home a non-sports guy? A few minutes later, the door opens up again. It's my uh, my my wife's brother. I said it right that time. Wow. You got a cigar? Yeah, it's in the bag next to the scotch. And he sits on my left side. We sat there for about an hour. Not one word is spoken. We're just drinking scotch, trying to think. We have no common ground. None. None at all. And finally, my father-in-law looks over at me, and he goes, So, uh... What do you do? I said I'm a cigar rep, and he looked at me and he was like, "You know, Brian, you seem like a good guy. <laughs> this is one of the best cigars I've ever had." I mean, let's be honest. We all connect over cigars. We, you know, we have so many great stories that start or finish with a cigar. Yeah. And we need to make sure that these stories and these open invitations of friendship never go away. Yeah. Well said. Eighty percent of the friends I have are cigar people that, that I've met through this store, actually. Yeah. You know. All right, so we're coming up on an hour, guys. Anybody got anything they want to promote before we go? Yeah, House of Emilio, <laughs> House, <laughs> home of the finest boutique blends. I'm talking the greatest tobaccos, Ezra Zion, everything 6 to 14 years old, double grade A, absolutely delicious. Nomad, keep asking for it, people. You know what I'm talking about. Fred Rui, one of the greatest Americans I've ever known in my life, and he has a beautiful mullet. <laughs> Guayacan, awesome sticks, absolutely boutique, real clean. Got a nice strength to them. Great price point. And then always ask, hey, where's your Epicurean line? And I'm Brandon Holsworth, and that's all I have to say about this. Bam! <laughs> Blow me up, dog! <laughs> Blind Man's Puff, you, got any, you guys got anything to pump? Uh, pump. <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. You dated your to father, plug, too. Bring plug. It. <laughs> Nothing particular to plug. Uh, I think Aaron's frozen again. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll keep up with the uh, with the info on this, and I'll I'll make an effort to post uh, uh, an easy way for our readers to to voice their opinions as well. Yes. So yeah, please, so please, for sure. yeah, yeah, please go to Blind Man's Puff and keep an, keep abreast of the situation. Mm -hmm. Am I the only one that keeps adjusting themselves so their their second chin doesn't kick out? <laughs> yeah, I gotta, why do you think I held my head up? My beard covers mine. That's why I have facial hair. Yeah. Kirk, you got anything to plug? Not really. Just join the join the CRA if you haven't, if you have the means. If you don't, you know. I, earlier, I mentioned talking to friends and family as being important, and I do think that it is. Uh, but that I, I didn't mean to say that you shouldn't also reach out to your lawmakers. Uh, I think that's equally important. And you know, do what you can. And the other thing I would suggest is when you have these conversations with non-smokers, don't be a dick about it. Always remember that you're an ambassador to the cigar community, and the other point that I want to make, um, you know, if you're going to smoke a cigar out in public, and I think this goes with it too. It's it's the broader picture of the way that smokers are perceived. You know, if you're at a restaurant on a patio, where, you know, ask your server if you're allowed to have a cigar if they mind, yeah. and if you have people around you at a, you know adjacent tables, ask them if they mind. I, don't be I, don't. My, that's my thing. Don't be an asshole smoker because you know what? Right. If if you don't smoke cigars. Then it stinks, and, and I think I think that's that's a fair opinion to have. I like the smell; others don't. It can be obtrusive. Um, so, you know, basically, that's all. That that's my finishing thought. It just be be a good ambassador to the cigar community, and I think everything will be all right. And also, if you're smoking a cigar, you should keep your feet in the pool, a drink in your hand, and a cigar in your mouth. Well, right. only only if you want to be truly happy. That's true. <laughs> all right, Coop, you got anything to uh, to plug? Um, well, obviously, on Cigar Coop, we'll continue to have extensive coverage of this whole FDA thing as there's more responses that come from the community, so expect to just continue to see that on our news. Um, I'll, I'll plug something of interest to Brandon on Thursday on Stogie Geeks. Um, we are actually doing um, – up. we have a studio up in Rhode Island where the rest of the Stogie Geeks are, and we are um, – going to be featuring, uh, he won't be in the studio, but Enrique Sanchez Acasa will be our special guest, and we're actually doing an in-studio event, so if anyone's up in Rhode Island, um, come on up, and uh, there'll be some 1502 cigars, and you can watch the show live, and you, we'll have Enrique dialed in uh, through the video. Yeah, that ruby that he has is absolutely fantastic. Uh, nice spice, good medium plus body, just nice. delicious. Nice. Yep. Yep. So keep abreast with the Cigar Coop and Blind Man's Puff. Mm -hmm. Listen and to Stogie Geeks and watch it. Good show. And uh, pull out Cigar you. Reviews. I'm sure we'll address this again. I know we'll address it again. Uh, but uh, be sure you go out and do your part, people. And I want to address one more aspect. I, I touched on it earlier, but not just cigar smokers. Retailers need to be fighting as well. I mean, you're going to yes. lose your business. You're going to lose a lot of business. So retailers really need to be involved in this. Yeah, for sure. Unless you want to be saying hi to people, welcome to Walmart. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, amen. Did you like fries with that? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right, guys. So we're going to shut her down. I want to thank you for all your opinions on this subject. And please, let's all be proactive and make sure we yep. let everybody know about what's going on. It's been great smoking with you guys. See you later, Brandon. You too. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Have a good one.